Hey there, fellow tree huggers. I am Pruitt, and this is Jim Davis. And maybe you've been looking around for info about uh, about forests, and uh, your search leaves you uninspired, and you shouldn't arbor resentment. We're going to have a conversation right now. It's going to branch out in many directions. We hope that this info takes root within your mind and game. Let's talk about forests on uh, on WebDM. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a lot of puns, man. That's just... What, what do you expect me to do? Jim, less puns, you're barking up the wrong tree, buddy. This episode is brought to you by Inkwell Ideas and their side quest decks, live on Kickstarter now. Has your party ever veered off on an unplanned path or taken an interest in a random NPC you didn't expect? Or maybe you're struggling to fill part of your world. A side quest deck is the answer. Each card comes with short summaries with background GM info, multiple adventure seeds, possible encounters, and follow-up ideas on one side with an adventure map on the other. The Kickstarter is for four new decks, Monster Hunts, Pulp Adventure, and two decks of Town Side Quests. Inkwell Ideas also makes tons of other decks like Classic Dungeons, High Seas, Wilderness, Horror, Superheroes, Spies, and a sci-fi deck and more. Whatever you're playing, Side Quest decks are there to inspire you. So check it out. Link in the comments and description. All right, Jim. So today we're talking about forests, but we can't talk about the forest without talking about for all the trees. I, I, I was trying to work that in there. It didn't really. Anyway, it's all right. Let's get out of the way early. Forests. Yeah. Where Where do you Where do you start when you When you're thinking about um, a campaign environment such as so expansive, so varied, like. You know, this isn't just another different color of a rolling grass plane. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> forest. Right. It's forest. I mean, yeah, there's something like to me, like forests and Dungeons and Dragons are just like really so closely linked. And I, I don't know if it's like all the fairy tales and, you know, ghost stories that are linked to, you know, dark woods or, you know, something, you know, yeah. something like that. Something lives in those woods kind of thing. But um, I love them for adventures because, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> I love them for adventures because there's just a lot going on in them right like in terms of scenery of stuff to do things to describe places for enemies to hide um you know mm -hmm. plausible threats and everything they're just really rich and offer a lot of possibilities first things first there's a lot of freaking types of forest so right yeah yeah. You might you might get hung up just picking what type of forest you're in. Is, is it an Arctic taiga? Is it is it a rainforest, you know? <laughs> yeah, there's really a lot that you could do with it. And and it's worth noting that in the both the Dungeon Master's Guide and uh Xanathar's Guide, which is where sort of lists of monsters and then the randomized encounter tables are, like forest literally means anywhere there's a lot of trees. And so you, we yeah. could be talking about any of those, any of the tropical forests, whatever. So um, obviously if you're using any sort of tools to create your adventure environments here and, and to build up encounters and an ecology or whatever, like having mm -hmm. some understanding of what's what kind of forest it is, is important for me. I just do a wiki dive, <laughs> usually, you know, uh, just going on and looking up the various landforms, biomes and, and the like that are there um, is enough to kind of get my mind going in terms of like, okay, what kind of fantastic elements are here? How am I going to describe this place? So when I think of forests, right, like foliage, cover, like the, the fact that this place is alive with so much life right like that you know, everywhere you look there's little insects and critters and creepy crawlers and then there's you know these sorts of plants and then there's like plants underneath them and then the grass and then there's all this little mold and fungi and it's just like life is everywhere and conveying that through description is how it was one of the ways that i like to bring a forest to life because it's sort of you can describe how far can i see what's in the way it, you know, can I hear things that are near or far? What sort of uh, distortion does it uh, have? You know, can I hear something crawling around under, under you know, the, the leaves and detritus on the forest floor? You know, moving through the tree branches, 
what does it smell like? Does it smell like rot and, and damp and mildew? Um, you know, those are ways that you can con convey a feel uh, for your forest. You know, how many shafts mm -hmm. of light penetrate the, ca you know, the canopy or any pools of shadow well, anything could be hiding, you well, know? Yeah, definitely. I mean, you just you just hit on uh, one of one of uh, a, a trigger word there, which is also you have to think about where you are in the forest because there mm -hmm. are layers to forest. Are you on the forest floor? Are you in the understory? What happens, you know, like right under the big trees? Are you in the canopy <laughs> of the big trees? Are you yeah. above that? Are you up there crouching tiger, hidden dragon style, fighting on right. top of the treetops like like any good monk should? Uh, <laughs> but like, that's the thing is you have so many different places that you could be playing and what you're going to find there, the hazards for each of those are going to be a little mm -hmm. bit different. Um, yeah. And, 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 and so it's just, there's so many options to think about. Right, right. So for instance, I like to think about this whenever I'm designing or, or considering combat encounters in a forest, really any environment, but by imagining the, mm -hmm. the physical space first, it's it's a lot easier to come up with ways to uh, imagine how that combat might go. What are the different tactics my enemies could use? What are some of the dangers that are there? Uh, and, but also like other sort of non-combat challenges as well. The fact that a forest floor is often covered in bushes and vegetation and fallen trees and animal carcasses means that there's all sorts of things that could be hidden just underfoot that you don't see. You could be walking across a ruin or or, or something and never notice it right because it's covered in foliage and you can't really see it from the ground and so like finding something in all of that can be a challenge in and of itself and like it's one thing to go like there's a bunch of trees everybody knows what a forest is or or something and quite another to be able to paint a picture by thinking of the descriptions and imagery and memories you have of, of being in woods and forests and the like uh and recycling it and remixing it for your players as a fantastic place as a place with magic and wonder and mystery and as a place that they can interact with uh is a skill that yeah. um it's gonna serve you well as a dm yeah you gotta you kind of have to do the inception thing where you draw upon personal experience but don't anything too too specific you just have sure. to use details like, <laughs> yeah so that it right. can be more emergent <laughs> in your world right um exactly but uh but but also, uh, when you think about your forests, uh, you know it's not all it's not all combat. We'll we'll get there. But like mm -hmm. one of the biggest things that I, that that a forest has is resources. Like what right. yeah. is packed amongst the, the 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 ground in in the branches that your players would be looking for. What mm -hmm. uh, what do they need? from this forest like this is when you get a chance for your rangers out there that are at peak players that are still playing them to to shine because mm -hmm. um, whether it's like you know food water medicine things like that like like what's in your forest jim i mean this is the part where i really want to ramp up the magic in the environments that i'm building yeah. you know the um the backdrop i want to be mundane and i, but I still want to be vivid right and, and to come uh, to come through but when i'm thinking about resources first off anything that's suggested by the description is going to be there right you know branches rocks dirt leaves dry brush whatever you know that kind of thing game is plentiful uh and the like um and I would push uh, for more exotic and magical resources as being the things that like to really dangle in front of players. So it's like rare plants and herbs and the like, or leaves, sap, roots, whatever, could have all sorts of magical powers. They could be useful as, as uh, you know, alchemy ingredients. They could have some sort of magical properties in and of themselves, just consumed raw. They could be cooking ingredients. Um, just there could be wildlife that's unique to that forest for whatever mm -hmm. reason that has uh, similar properties, some sort of symbiotic um, boon, right? Like a sentient vine that comes to live on you uh, or some sort of <laughs> something that like replaces your blood with, uh, you know, green plant sap that can photosynthesize, uh, you know, sunlight. And, you know, it's just, yeah. 
you know, whatever, you know, <laughs> I like, you should you like, don't, you don't need, you don't need to eat or sleep. You just have to have eight hours of direct sunlight. <laughs> right. That's right. It. Yeah. If you spend more than 24 hours in place, you start to put down roots. Uh, so <laughs> keep, keep walking. Um, so yeah, those are the sorts of things that, um, yeah. that I put in there and I, you know, the, Locations within forests that I've uh, built for games before include things like, you know, a tree that was struck by lightning and the pattern that the lightning left on it describes a spell unique to that location, right? Can't find it anywhere else. And then the heartwood of that still living tree can be splintered out and, and removed to create wands of, of you know, power for, you know, lightning spells or, you know, whatever, even if you just want to do like a, you know, taking this and spending some time with it as the equivalent of a wand of lightning bolts to do something more custom um, is a good place to, uh, to to sort of evoke these feelings of magic and wonder and, and nature in this uh, forest environment. Um, and then coupled with a guardian of some sort, something that uh, lives there and dwells there and embodies the forest in another way or embodies that location. So the ones that I've used are things like fire spirit, that's bound to the tree or like a charred and singed dryad that's been, uh, you know, that, that's, that's her tree that was struck, but she's been changed just as much as the, uh, the plant has. And like, those are the kinds of places that highlight the adventurous environment of the forest rather than just like, mm -hmm. they could be anywhere. It's like, no, this is a place that could only be here. And, and the, yeah. the backdrop that you've been describing brings out uh, places like that, but you know, moss covered yeah, dragon yeah. corpse that's mistaken for a hill that <laughs> is slowly poisoning mm -hmm. everything around it, that sort of thing. Yeah, I, uh, I, when I, th I think about that, um, immediately go to like Broccolon Forest from The Witcher, mm -hmm. and where they have to go and like drink the sap to make sure you're not uh, harmful, you don't have harmful intent towards the forest. like. Like simple things like that that you could do to highlight your force and make them seem more magical. Um, yeah, I mean it's it's always eating the sa get, getting to the sap of something to get its to get its magic. Yeah. Like uh, the same in like the fountain, right? That's sure. where the oh, yeah, yeah. you know the tree of life. If you can just eat its sap, you can live forever. You know, like have these look. If you put these locations in your forests, your players will go try to seek them out. You know, right. I, I want. I want to learn bark skin permanently. If I drink the sap from this tree, your skin will turn to bark. Like having, right. you can have effects like that uh, as fodder, as 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 lures, bait, whatever you want to call it, right. um, to bring to bring those PCs in. You know, yeah. And uh, whether or not it's a it's a real thing, or if it's just something that this is how the trees eat. <laughs> they let these things yeah. get out there because when you get close, yeah, you know, those trees eat. They, 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 they eat blood, the they eat meat and drink blood. Like. Yeah. These locations are, are great for uh, both sandbox style play where you want to seed your sandbox with a lot of places for the players to go and get something useful, beneficial, pursue their own goals or for more like adventure driven and, and adventure path style games as like a, I have to assemble the pieces of the MacGuffin. All right, well, I got to go to this place and get this wood from this plant. And then it has to be cleansed in the waters from this spring. And then I've got to travel up the nearby mountains to this other place to do a thing. And like that work counts as building the item. So you don't have to spend like a year in your character's lab while they put together this thing. And like time spent adventuring counts towards the item's creation. Uh, <laughs> and yeah. they're now they're now they're adventuring to build whatever it is that they uh, they want or whatever power they want to acquire. Um, so yeah, fun times. Okay, so that's our that's kind of the things that you can have in there as far as resources and draws and everything, but Every forest has has hazards, and right. this is where you can really kind of ramp up the weird and fun magical stuff while still yes. keeping it relative relativistically like natural, you know, natural right, the yeah. world. Natural world, and, and the hazards are like they don't have to be like harmful. In many ways, a lot of these game effects are just like modeling what it would be like to move around this place. In, in real life, which it's like, go walk through a forest without, you know, off, off the path if you can. And it's 
sometimes kind of relatively easy depending on what kind of forest you're in but in a lot of ways it's just the ground is littered with stuff you know mm -hmm. fallen branches fallen trees brambles you know layers of leaves and dirt and you know it, it's it's a it, it's not an environment that's like conducive to bipeds walking around and fighting and running and all that kind of stuff right so you can you yeah. can <laughs> you can like portray that mechanically with things like difficult terrain increasing the cost of something like difficult terrain right like instead of two per one it's four per one something um but this is this is where you bring the place to life like once a battle mat is thrown down because there's something very 2d about a battle mat there's something like i don't want to go through the hassle of of having all these special rules for this environment so the backdrop sort of fades in the black and it's like you're in that final fantasy screen where you're you're fighting your enemies just in a little clearing all the time <laughs> yeah in a little clearing in the forest <laughs> in the forest right no i want to fight in a forest I, I there's a reason why i'm not on a grassland or something in open ground i want it to mean something so like apart from the forest floor itself vision right so many things about vision in a forest that you want to consider um from a game mechanic perspective you know line of sight obscurement um what the level of light is uh you know there's things like you know you might say you can't see more than 30 feet away from you just period there's just too much stuff in the way or you know that there are these sort of pools of bright light amidst otherwise a carpet of shadowy dim light right a little 3.5 mm -hmm. throwback there um and uh <laughs> or even going so far as to say like unless you've moved you are in total cover right like there's some some forest environments where if you're moving you're in cover there's just so much there that's between you and and you know whoever they more than say 10 feet away from me and you're not moving th then you're you know it's still gotta like you know pass a perception check to be able to see exactly where you are um because you're otherwise out of line of sight and mm -hmm. um those are the ways that you can sort of like confine and reshape the way that the players approach this space from a mechanic perspective to like lend the narrative part of it weight you know the question of do i move and reveal myself you know is uh mm -hmm. interesting when it's like you're dealing with something that could take you out in like one or two hits you know like a big just nasty forest cat or something oh yeah definitely uh and also you know is that forest cat up in the trees or is right. it something that can't get in the trees and now you need to get up in the trees uh right. which then now you have to worry about now falling damage is a thing right <laughs> any type of like movement you know on the z-axis <laughs> if you want to start going up well every 10 feet's another d6 uh right. and if you do fall <laughs> here's my thing if you do fall can you uh -huh. stop yourself so you don't take as much? Like I would maybe, if I had a forest environment that had a lot of branches, and so therefore it had a lot of cover, obscurement, and you have a whole kind of a running weird like battle where you're trying to find them and coming up in the trees and you're climbing limbs and stuff, and then they catch you by maybe sawing a limb halfway through and now you have your basic drop trap, but you're right. 40 feet up in the trees. If you fail that initial save, I would maybe let you have a secondary save. And this is you just trying to at least mitigate some of that damage as you grab a limb on the way down like yeah you sure. fell there's still like eight right. limbs in between you and the ground so maybe you can stop yourself from get, taking maybe. most of that damage like mm -hmm. like these are the these are the kind of things that i would think about um just because there are so there's so much in the way there are so many limbs uh you know uh uh, thinking about like avatar where they're learning how to fall from great heights landing on these giant lily pad leaves like right. how crazy fey is your forest do you right. have these kinds of things like you know maybe you do and like this is a ver perfectly viable form of transportation that is just like a dexterity acrobatics check mm -hmm. and if you pass mm -hmm. it yeah you you just you just descended 200 feet through the forest to the floor in like 10 20 seconds taking no damage because yeah. maybe you learned how to do this trick 
the the three dimensionality of a forest and the the fact that it ha- it does have these layers and that each layer has its own sort of unique characteristics right it's more open in that middle uh portion of the forest um you know which are off the, the mm-hmm. floor but it's like now but you are also exposed you know and this is a an environment where like climb and jump speeds become really handy uh you know assuming that there's always a place to jump a place to seek cover a place to just like pop out of line of sight like this is where monsters like kobolds and goblins become real nightmares you know if mm-hmm. you're dealing with say 10 goblins and you never f- see more than three of them at a time and they're just constantly popping in and out of cover using little tunnels or, or tree paths or things like that um but even from like a non even not, not even considering monsters just like what feature of this environment do you want to exaggerate and and make magical in order to like present either someplace that's otherworldly or some sort of hazard or something, right? Like, so is it pollen season? It's now magical. Pollen is suffused through the forest air and it's like carries with it all sorts of, you know, charming or hallucinogenic effects or, you know, mm-hmm. makes you just lie down and go to sleep so that the plants can slowly bore their way through you and burst up through their (laughs) through your chest (laughs) you know is this place alive like is this is this fusion of of primal magic and everything here um like giving this place some sort of sentience uh yeah i i i really like oh yeah uh i really like this part of the world building because this will really let yourself go wild and just be like yeah this is not a uh uh, (laughs) not a normal place (laughs) Oh no, I, I I absolutely love the idea, like uh, uh, like an Avatar, Last Airbender, with the uh, the swamp forest and the the mm-hmm. uh, what was it called, the old Bannon tree or whatever, where yeah, it's yeah. the central tree and its roots have spawned the rest of this forest. So right. casting speak with plant doesn't mean you're talking to a specific tree; it means you're literally talking to the forest because it's right. all one one entity. And so, like that, that uh, I've always loved that kind of angle when it comes to forests. Uh, yeah, and it being like a almost like a nervous system for the world, right? Yeah, and it really makes sense in a D and D type fantasy world because, like, so many things do have a life energy to them, which you can just sort mm-hmm. of hand wave as whatever. But like, if you take it seriously. And it's like, well, what happens if a lot of that life energy just gets together and intertwines itself? And like, is this how elementals are formed, right? Is this how mm-hmm. otherworldly spirits are, are born on the material plane and, and, and either like come to animate a place or, or self-awaken, uh, you know, as, as treants or something like that? Um, there's some really cool stuff you can do by just sort of thinking through and imagining the hell out of these this place you've built and what, what you want mm-hmm. to enhance about it and showcase. Yeah. Well, Jim, we've been skirting the edges of like in- creatures and stuff that would mm-hmm. inhabit your Certainly. forest. So, yeah. uh, well, let's go, let's go ahead and invade here. Uh, because yeah. not only like every beast that could be in a forest, you know, should be, but like they being D and D there's this whole level of magical beasts that then, probably prey on regu- the regular beasts, not only them, but you. And so there's like a whole order, another order of the circle of life kind of. Thing. Right, yes. <laughs> Mundane and then the magical uh, that you kind of have to think about. But big yeah, beasts and yeah. monsters. I mean, what do you put in your forest, just, Jim? There's so much, right? So like when I think of something like a tropical rainforest, one of the things that always strikes me is is the niches that that wildlife and, and even plant life, right, like uh, mm-hmm. comes to inhabit for itself, and the specialization, and and you know a lot of ways you see this in like bugs and the like or insects, and and you know it's like oh that one looks like a stick or that one looks like a tree uh, leaf or something, or you know this one can lie and wait for another, and they all have to see these special adaptations, and I start thinking of like the standard monsters that would be in a forest and how you would adapt them to living in that environment specifically. You know, this is a place where there's a lot of biodiversity. There's a lot of um, just life, right? And so they've got to have some kind of edge in order to, uh, in order to make it here. And in a forest, that's usually like speed or camouflage, right? You either move really fast. So you're not in the open very long or you, 
you can sneak up on something and, um, you know, get really close before they might detect you. Um, I'm going to start at the top because one of my pet peeves is that I think green dragons, the look of them, the traditional look of them is just like, how are these the forest dragons? Like these, like when I think of a, a dragon that's supposed to live in the forest and call it home and treat it as like, it's, this is its backyard and it's the master of everything around here. It doesn't walk around, you know, it's the limbs might be kind of atrophied or, or, or like tucked close to the side. It's much more serpentine and sort of like slithering along the, uh, the uh, forest floor or like through some of the tougher branches that it could get, or if there's a, a patch of, of open air, it might glide through that, but it's essentially like a giant flying snake. <laughs> right? mm -hmm. Well, I was thinking of something, something it like uh, like a snake, but with like sh maybe sugar glider wings between its little stunted limbs. So that yeah. if it does, it, it it can kind of just do that. You know, I know the flying snakes can literally slither through the air and kind of flatten their body, sure. and, and they have a perfect glide pattern. Uh, but yeah, I, I'm right there with you, Jim. And also the the, the coloring of it would be, you know, more yeah. like camo, where to have like an interspersing Modeled. Of like green yeah. and brown, and like have just lichen and mold all over it. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. When it lies still, it just looks like a part of the ground, you know, mm -hmm. it, it might, or part of it might look like a fallen log or, or something like that. Like you could be, you could be resting against it and not realize it. Um, and so applying that kind of logic to, um, to most everything, I, I think the, the big ones that I'm, I kind of come back to as forest monsters are definitely things like dryads and treants. Those sort of monsters that are connected to a tree and and have some sort of power that miss, you know, primal power that they draw from it. Um, I love the idea of like tree herders, you know, of, of these treants that kind of take care of others that are, you know, others of their kind. Like what if every tree is a treant? It's just most of them are asleep, you know, and it's, mm -hmm. it's this handful that tend to them, but they think in terms of trees so like a bunch of humanoids coming through and cutting them down it's just it happens it happens too fast for them kind of to react so they they have to think of other ways to to keep these fast moving fast breeding mammal things from uh completely <laughs> completely cutting them down um mm -hmm. yeah those are some there's some of the ones that i think of any uh any that you have well, one one concept I've always loved to, and wanted to have in a forest is just a plethora of awakened animals. Whether it's yeah. a druid gone rogue, whether it's you know like elves that are being run out of an area by a in like a an invading humanoid race, whoever it is, the humans are coming, the orcs are coming, the dwarves are coming. Who gives a, who? It doesn't matter. Yeah. The elves have to leave their forest. And in order to defend it so it can defend itself, they awaken a bunch of animals to help A, slow them, slow down the other humanoids, but B, here, protect the forest as long as you can. We'll try to come back when we when we've, you know, kind of retreated, you know, <laughs> gotten gotten back together for a counteroffensive. But hold your own. That's always been uh, an idea. I've, I know longtime listeners know I've talked about this idea for a campaign. I've never run it, but a bunch of awakened animals defending yeah. a forest from uh, pervasive intrusion, you know, right. Uh, yeah. Come on. The forest it's, come you know, to life. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. Now. Yeah. Thinking about your sort of like horde of awakened animals. Um, one of the things that I, I really like about a forest is its connection to druids. And, mm -hmm. you know, to me, a forest is sort of wild. It's, it's, it's a good place for a druid to just like, forget they're a person, a human, an elf or whatever, you know, and, go full animal <laughs> and like yeah. a feral druid a druid that's sort of like they've they've forgotten what it's been like to live in civilization entirely they've lived so long as an animal or or most of their time as an animal and like the the, pe the people the, you know the, the creatures they keep company they're all animals too maybe awakened maybe not and so like mm -hmm. the you know even taking that a step further and it's like this is an animal that is you know, sentient enough to have taught itself magic and became a druid and can now turn into something, you know, like the wolf wear, uh, is, yeah, yeah. is another kind of forest monster that I really, really like, uh, and, and 
always find an excuse to put somewhere in a uh, yeah. in a forest I'm building. <laughs> yeah, you got to put a Terra West in there somewhere. But yeah, I, I, I've right. done that. I've done that concept. I've done a Mowgli, you know, he could turn into a bear and a snake and a tiger, mm-hmm. and like all sure. the Jungle Book animals. Uh, <laughs> that that that's a fun. That's a fun one. I, I, any other any other favorites you got for your forest? I got my old standbys, right? Trolls, ogres, and the like, really creepy, mostly because in a forest they can have cover and sneak and, and do things they can't otherwise in a dungeon or in the open. Um, you know, green hags, goblinoids, big spiders, those are all great as sort of like stock monsters uh, for uh, for mm-hmm. a forest. Yeah. Cool, cool. Um, yeah. Uh, and if you're looking to stock up your D&D adventures, head on over to Patreon, or you can uh, you can have a random encounter with, uh, with Jim and I every week. Uh, on when we release our podcast. So uh, check that out at patreon.com. Why do you have to make outhouses in forest? Because you can't pee here. Ha <laughs> ha!